Okay, why don't you tell us your name and uh, where you work? Well, my name is David Long, and I worked at uh, Merrill Lynch in New York City from 2000 to 2001. And I personally witnessed the 9 11 um, incident, and I'm here to tell you from my own perspective uh, what I saw as an eyewitness. So, uh, in the beginning, uh, that morning, I was taking the train in from uh, Queens, where I lived, and uh, it was around 8.30 in the morning, and I was sort of putting together my plan for the day. Uh, I had a lot of work to do. I was going to a, a meeting at the World Financial Center, and uh, in my head, and what I'm going to do really is just tell you, again, you know, what, what I experienced. So, in my head, I had my plan for what I was going to do. Uh, and it was quite detailed for that morning. Um, so uh, I got off the train at uh, Fulton, and um, that's uh, maybe uh, two blocks, perhaps three blocks from uh, the World Trade Center. And the first thing I knew was that uh, uh, I was hungry. I was going to have to eat something before I was going to get through my morning. So I'd stopped at um, a small uh, cafe uh, on a basically... Um, on Fulton Street, and uh, I was buying my food. Um, there was uh, a sound. It was the first uh, thing that I noticed. Um, there was a sound like a, um, a truck. I've told the story many times. It was like a truck going over um, a, uh, an empty pothole or something like or an empty truck going over a pothole, like a hollow boom. Um, and uh, the sound went through the whole building, like a thud, um, similar to maybe uh, like something really heavy hitting the ground, like um, uh, like an artillery shell or something, something loud enough that you could feel the the sound of it go through the whole building. Now, nothing had happened at that point, so you know I just thought, well, you know, it was just a truck or something outside. I just sort of didn't really think about it. Um, uh, before I go any further, I wanted to talk about um, something that happened a week before this. And to, to this day, if anybody asks me why I think 9-11 was an inside job, um, I'm going to tell you about something that, that I thought about uh, after the whole day, and I realized that it was odd. Uh, what it was was um, maybe a week before we were working at uh, uh, Merrill Lynch. And the important thing to understand here is nobody stops for lunch. This is Wall Street. Uh, if you're going to get food, you go buy it, you go back to your desk, and you eat at your desk. Uh, so the concept of having the entire floor stop what they're doing and go to a central area is just unthinkable. Um, I worked there for probably a year and a half, and never once did we do any sort of a training drill or anything like that. So a week before, a, very, a man came who was, I didn't recognize him, but nobody did, and um, we had to stop what we were doing and go to this central area by the stairwell, and he gave us a very serious talk for 15 minutes on what we should do if we needed to exit the building in an emergency. He was very clear and distinct about how we were to go down the stairs, where we would turn, what we would do, and we all had to repeat that back to him. And um, uh, he had a definite air about him that he did not want to be interrupted. It was very, very, very serious. And then he was gone. So we all said, okay, so we've been given a training drill. Great. And we went back to our desk. So um, the reason I bring this up is that uh, we never had a training drill or anything like that for a year and a half. It just happened, like a week before 9-11. We never saw that man before or since. So, you know, was it a coincidence that the, the Merrill Lynch decided to just have a training drill one, one week before the 9-11 disaster? Was it just uh, an odd coincidence, or did they know something was coming? Uh, my impression is that they had a reason why they gave us that drill, and I think that what it means is they knew something was going to happen. So, okay, going forward again, um, it's now uh, um, just after I've heard that first sound, and I'm in uh, this small cafe buying my breakfast. And... Um, so I've heard the sound, and I haven't really, you know, clued in that anything bad was happening yet. But the next thing I saw was um, uh, the, the door to the, to the cafe. It was open, and uh, it was a big glass door, very thick. And a guy 
ran into it, like just smacked into it and hit the ground. The guy was looking behind him and running the other way, so he didn't see that the door was open. And he went into that thing full speed. So the next thing I heard was the sound of this guy's head and his body going into this plate glass. Uh, the window did, uh, the window, the the door did not break, but uh, it very nearly did. And the guy hit the ground, and he was clawing at the ground like something had scared the daylights out of him. And he was like feet and hands just clawing at the ground, and he was off like a rocket. So at that point, I thought, okay, the sound, the guy hitting the door. There's something going on outside. And the whole place had cleared out. It was empty. So my next thing is uh, out of my paint for my breakfast because there's nobody in the place. So that was a bit of a conundrum, but I, you know, I decided, okay, I'm just going to leave my food on the counter. Something's going on. I can explain it later. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is psychologically, I'm starting to warm up to the, the, the realization that there's something happening, but I'm still thinking I've, I'm having an ordinary day in New York City and I've got to get to work. So I walk outside and I turn and I look where I think I'm going to see something and I do. Uh, there is a giant hole in uh, the uh, Tower 2, I believe, of the World Trade Center, the first one that got hit. Now, I didn't see any airplane. Um, what I saw was uh, a hole probably about 80 stories up, uh, smoking. There was some fire coming out of it, not a lot. Uh, and um, Fulton Street, uh, from maybe 50 meters from where I was, towards the World Trade Center, was just covered with debris. So, uh, personally, I mean, you know, that was exactly where I was planning on heading. If I hadn't stopped for breakfast that day, I wouldn't be talking to you. Um, everything in that whole area was just covered with debris from the building. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what to do at that point. Um, I think, uh, you know, my first urge was, you know, to maybe go and help, like, were there people who were injured? But, you know, almost immediately after that, I realized it's 80 stories up. Uh, there's nothing I can really do to help. The best thing I can do is probably just stay out of the way. Um, I realized this would probably be on the news and there would be some kind of panic, so I called my mom. Um, I figured, uh, I don't know, I wasn't sure how many calls I'd get to make that day, you know, what would happen, so I figured if I called my mom, she'd tell everybody else that I was alive. Um, so uh, then, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what happened. I called a buddy of mine. Uh, then uh, we talked for a bit, and I, I hung up on him, and then I was trying to figure out what to do. Um, now, at this point... I, I noticed in the building, I was looking at the fire and the flames, and this is something I, I really want to underline. I saw uh, long streams of molten metal coming out of the building, and they were not coming from the area where the impact was. So there was a large black circle where something had blown up up there, and um, uh, uh, that part clearly was caused by whatever had detonated inside the building. But there were places where there was no damage to the building, but there was molten metal coming out, just like uh, the stream from a welder's torch. But it was much longer. These streams were probably two or three stories in length, so maybe 20 meters, and they would, they would uh, go out into sparks and spread out as they, they went towards the ground. But I distinctly remember standing there going, what the hell are those streams of metal coming out of? That is like nothing I've ever seen. That's not fire. Uh, that's not smoke. Um, that is something hot enough to glow, bright orange, and it's coming out in a, in a stream. And there are probably at least three different places that it was coming out from the corners. So I, I remember thinking, you know, has somebody got a blowtorch up there? Like, what is going on with this building? This is the strangest thing I've ever seen. The explosion, okay. I know that there was a terrorist attack on the building before. I bet that's what's happened this time, but the molten metal, I don't know what that is. So um, I was standing there looking at it. Then I started to think, well, you know, maybe I should continue on to try and get to the World Financial Center. Um, I knew that some incident had happened, uh, but I also felt that um, there wasn't anything I could immediately do to help, um, and maybe I should just try and get on with my day as best I could. So. Uh, at that particular moment, 
I was trying to figure out what to do. Maybe I was starting to be in shock, I don't know, but that was my state of mind at the time. Um, so I knew I couldn't go down Fulton Street because that was a, just a wreck. There was debris everywhere. So I went the opposite way um, around the corner of um, uh, the main building where Merrill Lynch is. Um, and then I was going to go up uh, the adjacent street, so the one parallel to uh, Fulton. I passed a friend of mine that ran a, a computer store there. Now I remember him looking at me like straight in the eye for for five or ten seconds as I walked past and I'm not quite sure what sort of communication there was there but he was looking right at me like um, something I'm not sure what it meant but it, it, it was it was though we were realizing that we were in some kind of a moment here and we were staring at each other like something big was happening um, so I never saw that guy again after that uh, maybe once so now I'm at the corner um, by uh, Broadway where City Hall is. And um, I remember uh, there were four cops who were now running towards the uh, World Trade Center. Three of them were running out front. And then there was one guy who was, it was, uh, it was interesting. He slowed down a bit. He was the last guy. And he was looking up at the building. And he had some kind of look on his face like, oh, my God. Um, like, I didn't sign up for this, or I didn't expect this when I came to work today. So he slowed down a bit, and I don't know for sure, but I think he looked down at his badge and his uniform, and he said, oh, oh yeah, I'm a cop, or something like that to himself, and then he was immediately up with his buddies again. But there was a moment there where he sort of slowed, like, what are we getting into here? Um, all of us, I think, were either scared or on our way to being scared. But these cops were running straight into... Uh, what could have been their death. They may be dead. I don't know if those guys are alive or not, but uh, from a personal standpoint, I really, right in that moment, I respected these guys immensely because there was um, no, uh, no indecision on their part about what their duty was. So, you know, you can say what you want about how you feel about police before or after, but when you see a man make a decision about, you know, and this is a guy with a wife and kids, same as a lot of people, um, uh, when you see a guy make a decision to do his job, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's courage, is what you're seeing. So that was a big, um, a big part of my story. I've, I've never really forgotten those four guys. Um, so that aside, I'm now standing on the corner, and I'm going to try and still get to the World Financial Center. So I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. I've changed my route now because I obviously can't go up Fulton Street because... It's, there's something's happened. So as I'm standing there, I'm looking up at uh, the the other tower of the World Trade Center, and uh, this is where all, all hell broke loose. Basically, um, uh, as I'm basically looking at it, uh, there was first a sound like uh, uh, a detonation, um, like fireworks, but much louder. I could hear it echo off of all the buildings. Um, like an artillery shell, but loud enough that uh, you could hear it from across the city, like definitely an explosion. Um, there was uh, a ball of fire uh, that erupted from the building, and uh, it spread outwards. There was glass and debris going in a debris cloud, uh, basically right towards me. So um, I, I was looking at this, and I was thinking, uh, I don't know, I'm wondering if some of this glass or whatever's up there is going to fall on me. And then I realize I don't really have any time to find out. So uh, with the debris cloud now like coming over me, I'm basically, well, it wasn't over me, but it was well on its way to heading in my direction. Uh, and that all of this happened in just maybe one or two seconds. Um, I just turned and ran. Uh, and everybody on that corner did. Like uh, there were cars that were backing up, people running in between the cars. Um, it was uh, lucky, I don't know, it was lucky that nobody even just got hit by a car backing up as people were running in between. Um, I did not turn and look. Uh, I ran as fast as I could, but while I was running, I felt that any second something was going to land on me and that was it, it's all going to be all over. Um, I don't know if I've ever run that fast. I definitely have never run that fast at 8.40 in the morning. Um, so, uh... I, I ran to uh, 
a large building. It was next to City Hall, um, and then I turned and I was, uh, you know, pretty breathless at this point. So I think I just needed to catch my breath before I ran any further. Uh, there were a bunch of us standing there. Now. I don't know for sure, but uh, when I was looking at this, the other building that had been hit now, as I'm standing on the corner, I'm pretty sure that I it could have been a piece of debris, but it, to me it looked like a person that jumped or had been blown out of the building um, from a long way up, like 80 stories. And uh, I can tell you that as I was trying to decide, was that a piece of debris or is that a person, I could hear a woman's voice next to me um, say, oh my God. Uh, so, you know, there was probably at least one other person there who was thinking the same thing I was thinking, which was that was somebody who jumped uh, from the building or they were blown out or for, for whatever reason. Um, my impression um, at that point was still that a bomb had gone off in the other building. And I remember thinking, well, how did they manage to get a bomb up there? So I didn't, I never saw any aircraft. Uh, what I heard the first time was an explosion uh, when I was buying my breakfast and definitely what I saw and what I heard the second time at that point which was now you know around nine o'clock or something that was a bomb if you'd asked me what it was I would have said it was a bomb um, which made sense to me because that is what had happened before and that was just everything that that, uh, that you know my senses told me and, and the reason why I'm doing this video as well is because I wanted uh, get out what I saw, what I heard, um, and my personal impression from my gut and what I thought, uh, as clearly as I can state, because uh, I feel it's important that my truth is told, because I think it's what a lot of people do believe about what actually happened that day. So like I said, my impression was that it was a bomb. Um, so uh, the... Um, uh, the next thing I did, um, I bought uh, some water. Uh, I figured uh, there was going to be a lot of stuff happening today and water was going to be something that I was going to need. Uh, so I bought water. You know, There was a disaster on the way. I mean, we weren't sure if the whole city was going to blow up at this point. I'm stopping for some water. Yeah. So um, I'm uh, now going to go... I decided I'm going to basically go home across the Manhattan Bridge, which is the next bridge north uh, from the Brooklyn Bridge. And, um, uh, well, it's the next one up, basically. As you go up Manhattan, the Manhattan Bridge is the next one. So I figured I could probably get across that bridge somehow. Um, so I'm maybe 15 steps into this journey, sort of close to the bottom edge of Chinatown. And I'm standing there looking at, uh, at the buildings, now at this point the fire was starting to go out. Um, I was looking at the first building and the second one. There was some flame up there but not too much. Uh, a lot of smoke, papers coming out, um, big holes, but not really any fire. Um, so I, my impression was that okay this is really bad, America's had a bad day, but they're gonna fix it. They fix everything in America, they can fix this too. So what am I trying to say? Um, I didn't think for a second that those buildings were going to collapse. Um, they looked perfectly fine except for the holes in them. Um, my impression is that the fires were going out, so I figured they'd be working at this for a while, but I didn't think the thing that was going to happen next was going to happen. So um, as I'm standing there, and I guess everybody's seen this on TV, uh, the 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 unthinkable thing started to happen. The, the top of the first tower that got hit, which I believe is Tower 2, it started to twist slightly. Um, and uh, then there was the sound of a, an explosion, again, the same kind of one that I'd heard before. And uh, the sound that I really uh, wanted to talk about was the sound of all the people in Manhattan. Because everybody was looking at these buildings now. And one thing that, did, that you don't hear on the what you, on the media about this is the sound of everybody screaming. Um, like if you imagine the sound of a Super Bowl game and all the voices, everybody cheering, that kind of stuff, it's like that, but now ten times more than that. It's like the entire south end of Manhattan. Millions of people all saying no all at once. They're, it's like a, a cry, like they're all saying no, stay up, don't collapse. And it's like shock and disbelief. Um, 
to me, I don't. Uh, what that says is that they, they were all thinking what I was thinking, which was disbelief. They did not believe that those towers were going to collapse. To me, that's like human evidence. There was nobody there that thought up until that moment that those towers were going to collapse. I know that because I, could, I, could, I heard all their voices, everybody saying, no, this is not happening. Um, it was surprise that, 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 that you heard times like two million people or however many there are at, the end, at that end of Manhattan. Um, as the first tower came down, there were a series of explosions. It was like boom, boom. You could hear the echoes of the explosions echoing off the different buildings. Um, so there were, were these different reports coming from different, uh, by a report I mean like the echo of an explosion. So many of them. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, to me, those all sounded like explosions. You know, maybe those were iron beams bending or collapsing, but to me, uh, unless somebody tells me otherwise, there were, there were multiple explosions as the towers came down. Um, definitely the first one. The debris cloud was enormous. I'm really glad I didn't even attempt. Uh, I don't know what made me not try and head for the Brooklyn Bridge, but the whole place was just covered with dust. The dust cloud went all the way. It covered the Brooklyn Bridge, um, and I don't know how anybody would have breathed in that dust cloud. Um, incidentally, there were people who followed those exit drills that I told you about at the beginning, so they actually went down into the basement of the Merrill Lynch building, and they said there was that dust coming down the air vents, and they were all worried that they weren't going to be able to breathe. And There was panic in that shelter. I think a lot of people were really freaked out from being locked in that shelter because uh, they followed the instructions that that guy gave them. Um, I never even got there. I didn't happen to be in the office. I was going somewhere else, but I'm really glad I didn't even wasn't around for those instructions because... Uh, the experiences I heard of the people that did go to the shelter, it didn't sound good to me at all. Um, so that, uh, that basically was the first tower going down. Um, I never saw any aircraft um, at all uh, when, when this happened. Now, uh, they could have, you know, the aircraft could have come from the other side of the building, uh, but I'm just saying from my perspective, I didn't know that it was an airplane that hit the building. I, I still thought it was a bomb, and everything I saw told me it was, it was bombs in, in the building. Now, uh, Tower 7, um, I can tell you for sure in that whole thing that, that I just told you about, I never saw anything happen to Tower 7. Um, so I saw those explosions, everything, but nothing in there at all gave me any hint at all that there was any damage at all to Tower 7 at all. So to me, if you ask me why, I, why it was an inside job, another reason is that uh, there was no evidence of any damage to uh, Tower 7, certainly not from where I was. So the fact that it collapsed, um, I find to be completely amazing because it wasn't damaged in any way that I saw. So uh, I find that to be um, more than curious. It's, uh, I think it's a glaring uh, reason why 9-11 um, uh, has so many holes in it that uh, um, uh, it needs to be reinvestigated. Whether or not that will happen, I don't know, but Tower 7 is definitely not anything I saw have anything happen to it. Um, now, uh, just uh, around this point, or maybe a minute or two before, um, I did see a fighter aircraft in the sky. Um, I think it had uh, two engines and two tails. Uh, so it, uh, it, was not, it was loitering in the sky. It wasn't going very fast. Uh, maybe the time it took to cross the sky would be about the same time a normal aircraft like a jet would take to cross the sky. It wasn't going very fast. Um, I remember feeling relief somehow that somebody uh, was up there that hopefully was friendly because uh, what we just experienced was quite terrifying. But I can tell you for sure uh, there was a fighter aircraft in the sky probably about 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes at the most after uh, the first tower went down. Um, and it was a military aircraft. Uh, it had two engines and two tails, so maybe an F-15 or an F-18, I don't know. 
but I can tell you for sure there was a military aircraft there. Um, maybe a year later, maybe two, when I was still looking back on all this stuff, I remember thinking, how is it that an aircraft could appear 20 minutes after the disaster but not appear in time to stop it? Um, but the size of the, uh, the American Air Force and the number of fighters that they must have all over New York State, uh, the speed that those things travel, I'm sure it could cross New York State in about 10 minutes if it wanted to. I find it amazing that uh, fighter aircraft would appear in the sky 20 minutes beforehand, but somehow it couldn't make it there in time to stop what, what was going to be a disaster for the whole city. So uh, if you ask me another reason why I'm here today saying I think 9-11 was an inside job, F from what I witnessed, that's another reason. The fact that the military was definitely nearby, they were within distance to do something about it and they didn't do anything. Um, so I think that basically means it's a certainty that they knew it was happening and they let it happen. So um, that was, that's essentially my experience, what I saw personally during 9-11. Um, the rest of the day was basically walking across Manhattan Bridge. Uh, there were firemen and rescue workers on foot going into Manhattan. There were people leaving, streaming out of the city. Uh, they had gray blankets on them. Some of them were covered with dust from the, um, uh, from the debris field that came down from the towers. Um, I got across to the other side. Um, I heard that the subway was uh, open, uh, so I managed to get up to the subway on the other side in Brooklyn, and it was open, so I was able to take a, a train back out to my place in Queens. There were a couple women there. Uh, one of them was nine months pregnant. The other one I used to buy my lunch from over in, uh, uh, in the area around the Merrill Lynch office there. So uh, I persuaded them that uh, their plan to try and walk home was a little bit... Uh, impractical considering how one of them was um, nine months pregnant. So I went back with them back, I got my car in Queens and then uh, I drove them back to Long Island City and the other woman I drove home. I think both their husbands were pretty happy to have their, uh, their, their wives return to them. So uh, that was my rescue for the day. I helped two women get home. Um, I've all, I, looking back, you know, you can't do much in a disaster like that, but I think if you can do one or two things to try and help somebody, then you've you've done something. So I, I, I just one maybe the one good thing I that I think I can take out of that day is was helping those women get home. Um, so then uh, after that, it took probably three weeks for me to even find my boss or people from Merrill Lynch. Um, it was. Uh, uh, a long time before I was even able to start getting back to work. Um, I can tell you that uh, there were uh, a lot of people who wanted to go back to work in the area around the World Trade Center, but they couldn't because the fires were still burning. Um, the debris, what the rubble, it was still on fire for weeks after the disaster. Um, th there were many stories of um, uh, smoke. Um, the whole place smelled like uh, a mixture of uh, burned gasoline, plastic, uh, and, and I guess it was dead bodies. Um, so all of that we were in and around while we were there. Um, like the offices were shut down. I think we were allowed back there once to try and get our stuff. Um, but uh, uh, nobody could go anywhere near the site. And um, and uh, often the reason was that was given is that the fires were still burning. And people would remark saying, well, what, you know, that was two weeks ago and those fires were still burning? Like, what is it that's under the ground uh, that could possibly still be on fire? I can tell you for sure that those fires went for a long time after that day. What it was that was under there, no one knows, but I can tell you for sure that there were many stories and reasons given why people couldn't go back to that area and it was that things were still burning. Um, I walked through that area for six months. Our offices were moved to, uh, over to New Jersey, so I would go through that area uh, to get to the boats that go across the river to New Jersey. So um, I, uh, 
had plenty of opportunity to smell the air, and I can tell you it definitely smelled like, like I said, it was a, to me it was burned plastic, gasoline, uh, and, and dead bodies. If you were to mix all that up and, and smell it, that's what it smelled like down there. You're not going to be able to um, really know what that is unless I explain it to you. It's not something you can see on TV or on the news clips, but the, the whole place smelled like that for, for months after. Um, so that uh, is basically the, uh, the story that uh, I have as far as 9-11. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, what, what would you say to people, because um, this is going to be viewed by uh, whomever, um, what would you say to people uh, who wanted to know, like, for you to prove that you worked at Merrill Lynch, what would you tell them if they didn't believe you? Like, um, so they wanted you'd want proof that I worked at uh, at Just Merrill Lynch. If someone if someone was to doubt it, what would you say? Like, uh, I would. Uh, I worked in the U.S. Cash Equities Group. Um, I worked in the Securities Services Division over in New Jersey. I could give them the name of my boss. Uh, I could give them so much information about what I did there that uh, they could check any one of a hundred facts I could give them. Okay. Um, what would you say, um, how quickly would you say the cleanup took? Like, it took months. Like, are we talking January? Are we talking the end of February? What would... uh, the cleanup trucks were there pretty much the same day. Uh, it's amazing how fast they got there. And they were hauling stuff away. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up, actually. They were hauling stuff away almost immediately. And I mean, like, within hours. Um, so, considering, you know, that there, that was a... Uh, definitely a terrorist incident and that uh, I mean anybody of any reasonable uh, background would know that they would want to explore what had gone in there to do an investigation. The fact that they were hauling away all this uh, debris in dump trucks, you know, they were moving around stuff. Uh, I mean I'm not a police officer but everyone knows you don't desert, you don't disturb a crime scene or any kind of scene like if it was a crashed aircraft you don't disturb anything because you use that to figure out what happened. Uh, and they were just loading all this stuff into dump trucks and driving it away as quick as they could. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me why they would do that. Did you see a, 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 the same logo on every truck or, or anything like that, or was it just dump trucks from everywhere? No, I mean, uh, the facts that I've told you are the ones that I remember clearly. Um, I don't want to make any claims about anything sure. that I didn't witness. Okay. Um, how long, like, the, the mood must have been shifted, and, and it was a very traumatic for everybody. You had to keep going in, so you must have seen people, like, were they in shock for weeks? Were they in shock for days? Were, like, the dust, how long was it on the streets, that kind of thing? Uh, the shock, I think, was something that um, it set in for different people in different ways. Um, it uh, is something that uh, you can be so in shock that you actually feel like you're not in shock anymore. And you're actually, you, you've wrapped the dial all the way around and you're only, you're on a long journey back to being normal again. So, uh, you know, like <laughs> Wall Street's a tough enough place to work, but uh, I can tell you for sure when we did go back to work, uh, we, were, we were tough on each other like there was no tomorrow. Okay. Um, people were losing their jobs, you know, there was so much pressure. Um, it was, um, I mean, Merrill Lynch is a, is a great company, but that particular time was terrible um, for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think, do you have any questions? No, it's about the, the, the dust, you asked about the dust. Yeah. The, how long was the dust around for? Like, uh, well, there were layers of it um, uh, all over the streets. Um, uh, maybe a millimeter thick, but uh, uh, enough that everything was sort of covered in this gray concrete dust. Um, there was just uh, tons of it for blocks after block after block. Where were you when the dust cloud hit? Like, did you hide under something? Did you go into a building? Well, no. Like I said, if I uh, if I'd gone down the Brooklyn Bridge approach, down Fulton Street, I would probably be just drowning in dust. Like, it was a huge cloud um, like uh, once you were in it like you wouldn't be able to see anything um, but uh, uh, where I was like around just the bottom part of Chinatown because of the way the wind was blowing or whatever it just did not reach me 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got to actually just witness it. You didn't I saw it rolling down uh, Fulton Street, and like, you could see it going over the tops of the backs of some buildings, and then if you could look down side streets, you could see it going outwards, dissipating as it goes out. Uh, but man, I mean, it, it was it was enormous. I was just lucky, I guess, that I wasn't covered in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and you you also mentioned that it took you a while to recover from it uh, mentally, like you went through some stress. Um, mm -hmm. How long would you say? It years. Took seven years. So. It took years. Like uh, probably the first time I actually went and got some help for this was maybe uh, oh three years later, um, and uh, I was just. Uh, um, really uh, just driven right to the end. I mean, when I when I got home, you know, I remember talking to my dad, and he said, uh, if you, I said, Dad, you know, I just don't know if I can go back to work. And he said, if you give up, then the terrorists have won. Um, and that was enough to get me on my feet. Uh, and I'm like, I refuse to be beaten. So I was able to continue on for years because I refused to just throw in the towel and give up. That didn't necessarily mean I was any better. I mean, I was uh, um, having uh, constant memories of this stuff, and it was hard for me to focus. My career, I mean, you know, uh, imagine uh, somebody just setting off a bomb like that, and then you've got to go and sit down and program a computer. Uh, <laughs> like loud noises, um, if somebody would uh, clink a teacup together a little too loudly, I'd be thinking instantly some, another bomb was going off. Uh, so it was a nervous wreck. Uh, for quite a while. Um, but, uh, you know, with the help of friends and family and, you know, just distance from the event, you know, things dissipate and you can relax and sort of get back to your life. But, I mean, after that day, it took years for me to start to get my life back on track. When did you first find out about the 9-11 Truth Movement and how? Well, my skepticism was a personal skepticism in the beginning. Like, uh, and you know, it's interesting when the when the the this happened. I mean, the first thing I was thinking was we should get those bastards. Um, I was happy that Bush was president. I was iffy about the fact that he was uh, so right wing. But at that point, uh, I think that some serious butt kicking was needed. And you know, I'm. I'm definitely a, a, a supporter of peace. I don't believe that war is, is an answer. I don't believe in fighting. But after what happened, I thought, well, you know, if America is going to do something, I'm okay with that. I had the exact same reaction here mm -hmm. for two years. <laughs> yeah, because this is just beyond the pall of reason, and at some point you have to act. So uh, it, whatever they did militarily after that, I'm like, okay. I, w I was okay with that. But um, uh, that didn't last for a long time. Um, as I looked back more and I examined things and I said, I thought to myself, well, how is it that somebody knew that this was going to happen? Like the guy I told you about giving us the exit drill. Um, how, if they knew this was going to happen, well, why didn't they stop it? Um, and as I uh, looked at the event and I cri looked at it more critically, you know, the fighter plane. I was really stuck on the fighter plane for a long time because I thought, and this was me maybe looking for something to blame or someone to blame, but I, I was really stuck on this idea of why is it that a, a fighter aircraft could appear in the sky 20 minutes after, but not five minutes before, you know? And, um, uh, you know, the U.S. Air Force, NORAD, they spend billions of dollars on their defense. They, nothing happens in the skies without them knowing about it. They've been defending against uh, nuclear missiles from Russia for 40 or 50 years. They watch the skies very closely. Um, how is it that the best minds with the best equipment, the best of everything, could somehow miss this? Um, and that would, uh, that would really get me thinking. Um, so I suppose, you know, there was that. Um, um, and uh, um, the improbability, I think, of what happened, uh, the explosions, um, a number of things is I, you know, and this was probably a year or a year and a half later, I started to think that there was something odd about that. But it was just more a feeling in my gut. I didn't know anything about 9-11 truth or anything like that. It was just somehow something was really fishy about that. But it was just David Long who knew this sort of, this dark secret. Not any of my family, nobody that knew me, anybody uh, really knew what was going on inside me, which was some serious doubt because of what I saw 
and I couldn't match it with what was going on. Now another major thing that really uh, caused me to uh, really become a skeptic was the Second Gulf War. Because um, uh, for me, um, I, I saw for the first time a connection between the launching of that war and the mood of America at that time. Um, and uh, to me, I started to think now that something really sinister was going on because that was a war, you know, like you could say what you want about Saddam Hussein, but he is just one person. But there were millions of people who were victims of Saddam uh, who were now going to be victims of a war. Um, to me, it did not make any sense, and I didn't think that what was going to happen to the people of Iraq next was was good. Um, Saddam Hussein was one person, one being, whether or not he's the leader of the country is not enough to do what they did. Um, and uh, at that point I was thinking that the mood of America was one that it was out for justice and so if people, the government decided to go ahead and launch a war they'd have the support of, uh, of their population and uh, I started thinking well you know, was really 9-11, was it some sort of a media stunt to be able to provoke the people into um, supporting a war that they would otherwise never have anything to do with. And I was really thinking this on my own, and, and this was not before I knew anything about 9-11 truth. This was just my own evaluation. Um, and this had built up now for quite a while. Um, then I started to hear about 9-11 truth. It was either on the internet, maybe by luck or something, uh, I had been following 9-11 and I came across 9-11 truth. Um, I met uh, a friend of mine maybe a year and a half ago who was really into the, uh, I guess what you call the conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Um, but to me I got some validation in that. A person who was otherwise a complete stranger to me knew a lot of the things that I was concerned about, but for a whole other reason not because they were there, but because they had read about it and heard about it. So there was talk now going around. Um, and it eventually led me to really showing an interest in 9-11 Truth. You know, the 9 truthorg website, the wiki page. Um, I read Bob Woodward's book uh, called, um, uh, what was that? Something. Plan of Attack, I believe it was, but I became very interested now in trying to understand what's really going on with the world. Um, and I also became very concerned because uh, the, the arrow or the direction of the world seems to have gone in some way that I, I never would have thought. Um, in the 80s, we were all worried about nuclear missiles from Russia, Ronald Reagan, Gorbachev. That was the major theme. It was communism versus capitalism, and you can say what you want about it, but you knew that the political dialogue in the world and everything that shaped the events was all basically about those, those central things. Um, so I was comfortable w with knowing where the world was going. 9-11 was unexpected. It was a direction that I didn't understand. It didn't seem to gel with anything that America stood for, and it basically left me going, where is the world going? What, what is going on here? This does not make any sense to me. Um, and uh, so um, that's basically how I came to be involved in the 9-11 the Truth Movement. Um, if you get me started talking on politics, I'll go on for a long time. <coughs> My goal here today was really to talk about the personal experiences that, that I went through on that day and, and to bring that to people so that they could see and criticize, look at, evaluate, like it, don't like it, but an honest description of what happened to me on that day. Okay, uh, one final question for you then. Um, did, did you happen to know um, Bobby McIlvain? No. No? Okay. Um, his father, Bob McIlvain, um, is, is a very strong supporter. He's been trying um, to find the answers as well. And I know his son worked at Merrill Lynch, or at least according to him. So, um, do did you attend any of the 9/11 um, Commission hearings? Uh, did you watch them on TV? Anything like that? I watched uh, some of the um, um, 
things that people had done about the 9-11 Commission hearings. I, I followed the research, um, but I did not attend any of the hearings, no. Okay. How did you find out about the Ottawa group? Um, I think I was interested in knowing who was in Ottawa, who would be doing this. Uh, so I think I just Googled 9-11 Truth Ottawa, and I came up with your website. Great. So I, I sent you an email, and here we are. Awesome. Yeah, and you've seen our videos too. They're awesome. I, I really, uh, it's um, and especially in a conservative town, to stand up and, and do what you're doing takes a lot of courage. It's been uh, two years we've been doing it here in Ottawa. So, um, and we're going to be going uh, out on the 11th. Will you be in attendance? Yes. Excellent. That's Monday. Yeah, Monday at six. So, um, <coughs> okay. And do you have any questions, Vic? Um, while the towers were still standing. Um, you mentioned that you had seen uh, the sparks coming out. Mm -hmm. Did you hear any explosions? Did you see any flashes of light while the towers were still standing? No, I didn't see any flashes of light. Did you hear anything? Um, no. The, uh, the explosions were all in and around when those events happened. So the big ball of fire, the explosion, mm -hmm. when there was the building collapsing and there was movement, there were explosions, but in between it was eerily quiet. I think that's great. I think <laughs> hey, well, thank you very much, David, for your time. We appreciate that uh, you're putting this in the public record, and we're hoping that uh, it uh, makes a difference to somebody. We hope that uh, it encourages more, uh, more survivors to come out. Yes. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity. I salute what you're doing, too. And um, I hope that uh, uh, some uh, some small group of people, maybe a large one, start to think more critically and challenging uh, what is being given to them through the uh, commercial media and the government. There is nothing wrong in our society with asking questions, and I believe that that's what a lot of people need to do more of. Cool. I think that's it, eh? Great. Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Thanks. Do you need more water? Or? Got some here.